Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first Cavalry conversation of the spring. Uh, I'm Dan Fagan. I'm professor of journalism here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at New York University. I'm also the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program, a master's program, and the Science Communication Workshops, which uh, give uh, PhDs and postdocs and med students here at NYU uh, some training in science communication. So we care a lot about science communication, uh, and I'm really excited about this program. We're going to be talking about uh, visual visualizations, which uh, are becoming such a crucial part of how we do our work. So uh, as always, I will leave it to uh, Robert Lee Holtz of the Wall Street Journal, distinguished writer in residence uh, here at the Carter Institute. I'll leave it to Lee to uh, do the formal introductions, but I'll just say we're very grateful to Betsy and Enrico for being here. I'm very excited uh, about this program. And I'm also very grateful to our friend Lee who has done this, I don't know, Lee, I, I, I'm, I hesitate to say how many years, but it's got to be coming up on 10 years, right? Uh, yeah, okay, possibly <laughs> more. We've done, it's it's uh, timeless. It's we've timeless. done well over 100 of it's these programs. It's been such fun, who was watching? <laughs> In the last few years, uh, yeah. we, we've done them thanks to the generosity of the Cavley Foundation. Absolutely. We're very grateful to the Cavley Foundation, and I personally am very grateful to Lee. So take it away, Lee. Thank you, Professor Fagan. So welcome to the Cavalier Conversations on Science Communications. And our aim here, uh, for those of you who have not joined us before, is to bring together a leading science journalist and an eminent scientist who reaches a mass audience to talk about how science communication is changing and how we can do it uh, just that much better, how we can get uh, accurate and timely information about new research to the general public who these days needs it more than ever. Just to uh, look ahead for a moment, uh, this is the first in our spring series. On March 25th, uh, we'll be uh, digging into the coverage of the recent uh, vaping uh, epidemic. Uh, it's a word we're throwing around a lot these days. Um, Vaping-related illnesses with David Downs, a remarkable reporter from Leafly, and with uh, Michael Siegel uh, from Boston University on April 8th. Uh, we'll be exploring the gender mythology of testosterone with Barnard College researcher Rebecca Jordan Young, who is co-author of a new book called Testosterone, an unauthorized biography, and with uh, a remarkable award-winning journalist, uh, Christy Ashwanden, who uh, writes about gender issues and sports medicine and other related issues. On April 21st, um, SHERP director Dan Fagan is going to hold a special conversation with uh, a renowned climate scientist, Catherine Cahoe, and New York Times climate reporter, Brad Plummer. Uh, but tonight, uh, what we're looking at, if I may say so, is the big picture uh, of big data. At best, at its best, science journalism is the artful literature of fact. And to make those facts engaging, we enlist all of our senses in our stories, sound, smell, sight, touch, and hearing, and technology, of course, extends those senses into new realms by harnessing the sensory data of social media, sensors, satellites, genetic testing, smartphones. And in this sense, big data has become brush strokes in an emerging portrait of human behavior and science on which we report. So I'd like to talk this evening about the ways that data can enrich the vocabulary of storytelling by giving vivid form to ideas, to trends, to alternative futures, and the invisible geography of the places that we inhabit. And we're joined in this endeavor this evening from San Francisco by journalist Betsy Mason. She is an award-winning freelance writer and editor who specializes in science and cartography, among other things. Her work appears in publications including National Geographic, and Science, Nature, Wired, Science News, Scientific American. She co-wrote a cartography blog at National Geographic and at Wired, where as online science editor, she founded the Wired 
science blogs network. She won the American Geophysical Union David Perlman Award for her coverage of earthquake risk in the Bay Area. She's secretary of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing, and she's co-author of a remarkable, uh, uh, lavishly illustrated book, All Over the Map, A Cartographic Odyssey. And from the science side, I introduced Enrico Bertoni. Bertoni. Enrico was a science assistant professor at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. And his research focuses on the study of effective data visualization methods and how to communicate complex ideas effectively through visual data presentation. Now, he also teaches an online specialization in information visualization course for Coursera, for those of you who are interested. And he's co-host of a very well-regarded podcast on data visualization uh, called Data Stories. Uh, he also writes for Medium, and he has often collaborated with ProPublica and other journalists on data analysis projects. So thank you both for joining us, and let's start this way. Now, to be sure, the way we visualize data shapes how we perceive the world. I mean, this week, who among us does not look and visualize and conceive of American politics through the geography of red and blue states? Or think about the coronavirus in any terms except the spreading stains we constantly see uh, projected onto global maps. So for science journalists, data visualization, I think, is an especially tricky matter. We not only make our own graphic mistakes, perhaps, as infrequently as possible, maybe. But because we report on published reports of uh, other scientific findings, we're also uh, running the risk of being misled by the mistakes that scientists might make uh, in turning their own data into charts and graphs. And so their mistakes compound ours. So Betsy, science is littered with bad data visualizations? Yeah. You're nodding, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping there aren't a lot of scientists watching this. Um, yeah, and that's extremely problematic for the science and uh, also for science journalists who are looking at those visualizations. Well, what kinds of things are we talking about? Well, I think uh, visualizations are often, for a lot of scientists, the very last thing that they do, and they think of it as, uh, you know, just some pretty things that they need to have in the paper that they're presenting. Of course, that's some scientists. Other scientists do a, a, an excellent job. Um, and so if you're not putting a lot of thought into it, um, you're going to make mistakes, for sure. And there are so many ways to make mistakes. Um, I think one of the best ways to make a mistake, or the easiest ways to make a mistake, is with color. Uh, scientists tend to misuse color all the time um, in ways that can even mislead themselves about what is in their actual data. Do you have an example of that? Uh, I have, I can tell you about an example. Tell me, yeah, uh, please. This is, of course, third hand um, from a climate scientist who told me that there was uh, a scientist who was looking at his data using a rainbow color scale which we've all seen. You see them for weather maps and for, you know, it feels like every scientific map visualization there is. Uh, and because of the way the spectrum is not uh, visually uh, consistent, the change isn't consistent through the spectrum, it can appear that there are sharp divisions in places where there are not. And so this scientist was interpreting a uh, sharp division, a, sort of a front in, in his uh, data that wasn't there and um, published a paper on it, I think, or maybe just mm -hmm. presented it at a conference, but it just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. The divisions between some colors look sharp while others look very gradual and it just doesn't represent the underlying data mm -hmm. appropriately. But now scientific journals um, have standards. Yeah, and the rainbow color map is standard. 
and that's part of the problem. It's very difficult to move scientists off from something that they've been doing for a long time, and there's good reason for that. If you have consistency through time with the way that you do science or visualize science, then you can compare things more easily. But if you're talking about the rainbow, every single color scale is representing data wrong in a different way, and so the comparisons really aren't that valid, and it's just, I think, a habit that's hard to break. Yeah, so I guess I, I see this called, uh, uh, categorized as chart crimes. Um, <laughs> I, see, I see a lot of literature talking about the chart crimes that uh, journalists are, are routinely committing uh, with data scales or cherry picking data to make a point or whatever. And, and Enrico, I, I wonder from your standpoint now, um, what is it that journalists do when they approach turning data into visualizations that makes you particularly crazy? Can I say it <laughs> to, to a room full of I hope so, <laughs> because otherwise we're going to have a long silence for the rest of the evening. I think, uh, honestly, I don't think that the problem is exclusively on the visualization side of things. I think that often the problem is that in journalism, as well as many other endeavors, uh, people uh, design a visualization to convey something that they already have in mind. They already have a preconceived message. And they try to mm -hmm. create the visualization that best com find the data and the message and the visualization that best conveys the person's view of the world. And I think we have this um, idea that when we are visualizing data or providing numbers that come from data, they are close to the truth. And I don't think that's that true. Yeah. So there are so many ways in which data can be used even without doing any crazy manipulation. Um, it's easy to select the data that tells the story that you want to tell. But isn't that the point? <laughs> I mean, it's a catch-22. No, right? I mean, that, yeah. that uh, it's, it's true that, that we come as readers or, or viewers, uh, come to the, the graphic with the assumption that what we're seeing is almost certainly true. But if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're suggesting is that actually, no, um, uh, a graphic is an argument. Absolutely. Uh, that the use of data. Absolutely. I, yeah. what, expand on that. What do you mean? <laughs> What I mean is that um, I think when, whenever you try to present something, an art, you nev whenever you're trying to present something that is based on data, you have two options, right? You have, say, with the constraints that you have in journalism, uh, my sense is that you can't really go too deep and present all the caveats that are behind a given scientific piece of scientific knowledge or experiment or, or data that has been acquired from, from some source. So because of that, um, you just can't explain everything in detail. But if we look at how good scientists look at, at data, I think they look at data with um, as much skepticism as possible. And I think one problem is that in journalism, it's hard to um, write an article when you are making a point and then saying, oh, by the way, I'm not that sure about, about this point. <laughs> so I, this is interesting. So I thought, well, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, what color bar should be on a, <laughs> yeah. on, a, on a fever chart, although I guess there aren't any bars in a fever chart. Um, but what I'm hearing from you two really is that now that this process starts long before anybody puts pen to pencil or, or uh, uh, Apple pen to uh, iPad, that the underlying data um, is driving all of this. So, so Betsy, what, what from your standpoint, now I know that you're intensely interested in mapping and in maps, but uh, what do you look for in a data set? What, what makes a data set appealing visually, <laughs> potentially? Oh, that's a tough question to answer. Um, of course, if I'm looking at a, a data set, I'd want one that's already clean. <laughs> what do you um, mean, already clean? Oh, well, you know, anybody who's dealt with any data set knows that you have to spend far too much time 
cleaning up the data, getting rid of you know different artifacts and empty cells and you know things that are just periods in the wrong place, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I guess you know we were we were talking earlier about um, whether uh, just because you can make a map or a chart with data if you should. Uh, and I think that that mistake of making uh, a visualization when one is not necessary, it's not going to add anything to the story, and it could potentially be misleading, is made quite a bit. So if you have geographic data, the tendency is to think, great, I can make a map. Uh, but if the point of, of your story or of the visualization isn't geographic location, then that's just not a helpful visualization, and it might be difficult for the reader to actually get the information out of it that you want them to. So from your standpoint then, this, what is the purpose of a visualization? To inspire, explain, analyze, educate, wow? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I had you at wow. <laughs> all, all of that. Um, I think you know, there, there are generally two things you can do with data visualization. There's um, analysis and exploration where you're looking for things in the data. You're using it as a reporting tool or as a scientist is you know, exploring the data to see what might be in there, asking questions of the data. And then there's the, the visualization presentation side to show a result that you have or a point that you're trying to make and everything in between. So Enrico, from your standpoint, what do you look for in a data set, what um, makes it appropriate for a visualization? I mean, are all numbers equal? Um, I think I, I really like what, what you said. In visualization, you can, you can either use it to present or you can use it to understand something better yourself. And I think what we are looking in a visualization is different according to whether our goal is to explore and analyze or communicate to others. I think personally when I think about a data visualization that is used for communication, I think the goal is to make something as clear as possible. So if one way I like to think about it is what I ask myself and I, and I typically tell my student to think about it is what is the questions that you want people to be able to answer when they when they look at a visualization. Make it, make it explicit. What are these questions? And then if you can, I think this is a powerful tool because then you can look at your visualization and say, does it answer the question? If can, it does Can you give me an example? I mean, what? This is sounding um, very theoretical. What? what uh, sure. Uh, I have to think about it for a moment. That's permitted. It's OK. You can uh, think. It's OK. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think. Um, very simple, I don't know, sometimes mm -hmm. in, 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 in my course at NYU, we use uh, data sets coming from, from New York City, um, say uh, from, from the open data um, portal, and there's um, a common one where there's restaurant inspections, right? And um, this is data that is continuously updated about in in inspections that are performed in the in um, New York City restaurants mm -hmm. and um, say that I want to answer, um, do different type of cuisines or restaurants have different type of violations, right? Um, now, I ask my students to create a visualization that answers this question. And once they create, there are so many ways to create visualizations that answer these questions. You can come up with 10, 20 different data visualizations on the same data answering the same question. Now, which one is best? I think it's the one that answers, that if you show it to somebody, can answer the question very quickly and very easily. Some are better than others. Does it make sense? Well, it does. <laughs> but you seem surprised. <laughs> no, what I'm thinking is I, I, I agree with that, and that sounds wonderful. But I'm, I, here I am with my pencil and my Apple pen and a blank pad, and I don't know what kind of form this data should take. What is most effective? I mean, uh, 
What about a pie chart? Why don't I do a pie chart, Betsy? What's wrong with pie charts? Well, wh what are you trying to show in the data? Like this, here's a good example of a place, if that's the question you're asking, are different types of cuisine more likely to have different uh, ratings from the health inspectors, a map doesn't make any sense. Correct. If you're wondering if different areas of the city have you know, mm -hmm. more problems than others, then, then a map would make sense. If your point is to uh, understand the differences very precisely between the cuisines and how, how, you know, how many failing grades there are with each type of food, then you would probably want a bar chart where it's very easy to compare the lengths of the bars and you can see precisely the difference. If what you want to say is something about um, how many failing grades there are relative to all of the inspections, then a pie chart might be okay if you know you're if you're if you're saying I don't know mm -hmm. how they grade them here, but if there are only a few A's, you, and the point is it's, it's alphabetic relative yeah. to yeah. the whole of all mm -hmm. the restaurants. There's only a few mm -hmm. A's. Pie chart is fine. Mm -hmm. If you want to know precisely the difference between the, how many mm -hmm. A's and how many B's, then that's going to be really difficult okay. for a person to read. Okay. So if if I can can cast you for a moment as as the the graphics guy mm -hmm. uh, in a typical newsroom, there's a division of labor, and you're the journalist. It seems to me there's a moment when there should be some kind of conversation between the two of you before the subject of doing a graphic even comes up. Mm -hmm. what, what is that conversation? What, what the, I would, the question? You need to hone the question? I would ask her, what is it that you want to communicate? If a person is looking at this data visualization, what, what is the message? What should they be able to, to answer in, in, in a few seconds? Uh -huh. So do you think that in the typical newsroom, those conversations are happening? I mean, what's I, your... I don't know what's typical. I, I think yeah, there's a broad range. there is no range. typical I newsroom mean, I anymore, suppose what's probably typical is that the journalist gets entirely through with all their reporting, and they're, they're in the process of editing, and the editor decides they need some art to go along and you know, break up the words, and then we go to the, the, to the art department, as it's usually called, and say, you know, make a graph of something. <laughs> um, that's obviously not a great way to do it. Uh, but there are, you know, in, in other more enlightened publications, there are lots of conversations about when the graphics team should be involved. This is a thing that's important at National Geographic mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, the visuals of National Geographic are very important. So the cartographers are often brought in fairly early in a story to, to be able to help tell the story because what they can tell on the map will change what what the the uh, journalist, the writer, you know, how much how much they need to carry, how much of the load they need to carry with the words, and mm -hmm. how much they can leave to the map. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to interrupt and tell our, our unseen uh, uh, listeners that they uh, can send us their questions um, by tweeting the hashtag uh, Cavalry Convo, and and we will relay them, and and you will be able to participate too. And I remind you all again that this is a conversation so please feel free to come around to the mic and ask questions um so hey, can i add one yeah thing yeah to this you, one? Please, because please. i just said that one criteria would be fast right, right? Mm -hmm. but i think that's uh, that depends on context as well so i'm assuming that when you said journalism and we are we are yeah. in a newsroom sure i i assumed we we have to publish something really quick and that people can't really spend too much time reading this article. Yeah. But of course, this is not true for every case, right? Even within journalism, there are certain pieces that are supposed to be read without, with, with more depth, right? More time and mulling over it. So it's not necessarily the criteria that people have to be able to read something fast. Uh, with clarity, yes. Um, um, visualization has to be clear and understandable, comprehensible, but not necessarily, um, it has to be consumed fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a fair point. And let's use your uh, experience with ProPublica, if I may, mm -hmm. um, as a kind of test case for our conversation. Um, <coughs> you worked with them to do some analysis, uh, mm -hmm. which you should explain to us on Yelp reviews. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could just give us a sense of what that initial 
conversation that is this a story, is this actually a data graphic? I mean, what was yeah. that like, if yes. you don't mind bringing us in? So that would be the, the other side of data visualization that we, that we discussed before, that is more on the exploratory side, right? So now the goal is no longer necessarily um, to create a visualization to communicate something to the large public, but it's more like how do we use visualization to help a person or two analyze a very specific data set. And that's the type of work in particular that I've been doing with, with ProPublica. Uh, we've been working with, in, in particular, with one of two or two journalists from, from the newsroom who wanted to analyze very large sets of reviews from Yelp, uh, specifically to understand, um, among other things, um, medical malpractice. So these were all about uh, <coughs> comments, um, customer comments about um, healthcare services. Okay. And as you can imagine, if you want to understand um, what people say about doctors or medical services, and you have hundreds of thousands of reviews, that's not that easy. You need right. some sort of tool. But to going do that. into this, the reporter that you were working with, he or she actually had no idea if there was like a, a trend or a pattern or a, yeah, so, a telling yeah. uh, yes. insight to be had. They just knew they had a, an immense compost heap of undifferentiated data, and they looked to you they may to have make a, sense a, out of it. Absolutely, yes. They, they may have had ideas that there's some patterns there and interesting. Like, is there, interesting. Are, are doctors that have a lot of malpractice suits also getting a lot of bad comments on Yelp? Like, that would be interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story, but I think some of the work that they wanted to do is to be able to identify different type of malpractice and then what journalists are at ProPublica do, they, once they identify a specific, an egregious case, they would mm -hmm. just call the person and, and, and say, look, there are 10 people who say that you've done this and we want to publish an article about that. Do you have anything to say before we do it? Sure. And so that's, that's the way it works. But <laughs> I'm back on the, it's very common now, I mean, uh, New York City, I mean, we could even talk about this later, yeah. but uh, I think the last time I looked, there are 2,600 and something or other public data sets, huge collections of municipal data of every sort that New York has been collecting in the course of doing its business and has coded it all and has stuck it up online, yeah. and there it is. But but you know those are just like dumps. I mean, how do you come to something like that with a question? How do you you? That's why I want to understand this Yelp business. Mm -hmm. You had no guidance going in. It was like, what can we find, mm -hmm. if anything? And and I want to understand. We'd like to understand how visualizing that kind of data might help you analyze it. I think the, the, the most important ingredient is somebody has to have some questions. I, 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 I am skeptical of the idea that you look at data for, I mean, I can do it for the fun of it because I like it, but in general, the, the real value comes from the question and then from, from the data, right? And um, I think in this case, we, we, what mm -hmm. was really um, good with the project with ProPublica is that they did come with questions, but they didn't have the tools that allowed them to answer these questions. So basically what we did was to create a data visualization tool that works on top of um, Yelp data that includes um, the reviews, the several statistics, and help them uh, quickly focus their attention on the subset of the data mm -hmm. that answer the questions that they have. Yeah. So, so I know that it's, it's a little yeah, abstract. No, I understand. So. It, but that's the point. It's a very <laughs> abstract intellectual exercise. Yeah. One of the things that's kind of marvelous about maps, I mean, they're kind of like a, uh, our original metaphor for organizing information. <laughs> I wonder in your uh, uh, looking through the history of that sort of mapping, I mean, 
What, what are the examples that stand out for you that might point us into how to approach the geography of mapping through things like geotagging and whatever, that what kinds of questions we might be asking that could yield informative visuals as maps? You're asking me, like, what are the best maps in history? Sure, <laughs> sure, In sure. terms of what they were able to show? Yeah, um, okay. Gosh, that's, that's, that's a hard question. There's about 15 maps just popping into my head right now. Okay, well, <laughs> just... Um, I guess one, one that comes to mind is, is a, a set of maps that was in an obscure Army Corps of Engineers report from the 1940s, I think, about uh, mapping old abandoned river channels of the Mississippi River. And this, uh, these maps were commissioned by the Army Corps because they were trying to understand better how to control the river. And um, by looking at its, its history, they could understand different things about you know, where they could build levees and what the, what the river might be prone to do. Um, and so each channel that was mapped is in a different color. And so what you end up with is this incredible sort of swirl of, of colors. It looks kind of like uh, different colored spaghetti. Oh, it's the first map in the book. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, once at some point, there it is, that's just one, one piece of it. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. <laughs> Uh, and so there's, I think, 15 different maps that look like this that map the entire Mississippi River from, uh, from Cairo, Illinois, down to the Gulf. And uh, at some point, a cartographer found these maps and just basically, I think, you know, put them out there and the cartographers went berserk for these maps because they're just such an effective um, way to show how dynamic the river is and how much territory it covers. I mean, this is like 50 miles across here, and that's how much the, the Mississippi River has traveled over the past few thousand years, and now we're trying to hold it in one place. And at the same time, in addition to that wonderful big pattern and big message, there's an extreme amount of uh, very specific detail in these maps as well, and that's really hard to do. So I'd say that these are, these are a good example of what, how effective a map can be. Professor, do you have a question? I do. I thought I'd ask the first question just to get the ball rolling here. Uh, <laughs> so back in the day, back in the old days, uh, when uh, uh, people did their, most of their journals of work in newsrooms, you know, there used to be this person called the graphics editor. Mm. Uh, because back then we called visualizations graphics. And the graphics editor uh, at the newspaper where I spent a lot of years would always say, keep it simple, all graphics should be instantly understandable. You know? and, and now we're in an era where not only we, we have these massive data sets, but we have the capability of, of layering multiple data sets. And it's just not that difficult to produce very complex visualizations, what we used to call graphics, that definitely violate that editor's old maxim. So I guess my, my question is, in, in, a, in an era when we can produce things of immense complexity without much difficulty, it sh is that what we should be doing? Because I see very beautiful, very complex graphics, even in the New York Times, which has an amazing, uh, an amazing art department. Uh, I see things that routinely violate my old editor's rule of instantaneous understanding. And I wonder what you all think about that. And since we can do more complex things, should we be doing that or, or not? Yeah. I think that's a great question. Like, um, just because we can do really complicated, interactive, you know, dynamic scatter plots that turn into and all move at the same time and mm -hmm. uh, you know have we is our ability to make these visualizations outstripping our ability to kind of really perceive them if I Dan doesn't mind me paraphrasing there uh, Betsy 
there's a lot there. I think uh, <laughs> that, that graphic setter was probably underestimating his readers. Uh, and I think that's a really high bar to instantaneously be able to understand something. I mean, a lot of good graphics, you can get a, the, the main message or some message from it instantaneously, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's nice if there's more to explore and you can get more out of the graphic. But one big question is always what to leave out. Well, but I think that this touches on something that you make a point of um, that impressed me, which is that in order to improve these visualizations or to make effective ones, we really need to have a better understanding of the strengths and weaknesses and biases of how human beings actually uh, perceive the world. I mean, what, what, what are you driving at there? I mean, you mentioned color, for instance, mm -hmm. but literally there's a kind of neurological thing going on here when we look at stuff that affects how we judge it. Yeah, I mean, Enrico might be able to speak to this a little bit better because, you know, data visualization specialists are very aware of these, um, of these aspects of the of visual perception that um, make humans, you know, better at worse at interpreting different types of graphs. Um, and there's been research for decades on this showing that it's much easier for people to uh, compare the lengths of two bars than it is for them to compare differences in angles, like in a pie chart or an area, which is another aspect mm -hmm. of the pie chart, or um, you know, changes in, in color. Um, so you know, I think the, the sort of fallback position is to use the easiest possible uh, visual representation for humans to understand that still conveys the message that you want to. So if you, can, if you can convey it with a bar chart, then use a bar chart because people are going to be able to understand that better. Especially if the point, like I was saying before, is to be able to understand um, you know, accurately the differences between two values. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's, the research has gotten much further and people are, are, are going on about um, you know, all the different aspects of visualizations that um, you know, doing uh, testing with uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk where you can put out a visualization and just you know, very cheaply get some highly unscientific group of people, <laughs> uh, non-random sample to, um, you know, to try to interpret these graphics and you can from that learn you know, what is easier for humans to discern. And so, you know, like with color, uh, another pitfall is that if you put two colors next to each other, they're going to interact. Uh, and so if you have got a light color surrounded by dark colors, it's gonna look a lot lighter than it would look if it were surrounded by uh, a bunch of colors mm -hmm. that are even lighter. And so if you're interpreting data where there's lots of colors next to each other in you know, cells or, or whatever, um, by cells I mean like on an Excel chart, not, mm -hmm. not um, in the body, uh, then you can, you can actually misinterpret data because of the, the contrast issues between hmm. shades. Hmm. I know I was uh, uh, intrigued to see online as part of my preparation for this that actually there are a, a set of um, of uh, apps actually um, for uh, uh, running color graphics uh, through various uh, simulations of how a colorblind person mm -hmm. would yes. see them. Um, in I mean, there are different forms of colorblindness, but it's a significant portion of the population doesn't all see color the same way. And uh, that clearly it's like a challenge that the community is dealing with. You were nodding while she was talking. What is it about um, the way people perceive stuff that that actually serves as a useful and important limit on how complicated these things can get? Well, data visualization is based on, on the science of how we perceive um, the world with, with vision, right? Yeah. So every time we uh, design something that breaks the rules in a way mm -hmm. or go, goes against or doesn't take into account the way we see the world with our eyes, um, you have I'm sorry, you have problems. And um, yeah, some of, some of the examples that she mm -hmm. mentioned come from, from the literature of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, human vision. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are many of these examples, many. 
I mean, people are all it's, familiar. You've, I'm sure you've seen online. You can go on and, and look at different visual illusions um, that that, yeah. that you know that we're susceptible to, and you know if you don't take some of those into account, then you're gonna you're gonna have problems. Yeah. Do you have examples of things you like? Uh, yeah, I can I can show. Uh, and then I'll uh, maybe while you find those, do you have a question there. Go ahead. Hi, uh, so for someone who was never trained to do data science or data journalism, is there a tool out there to help us um, like get the ball rolling? Because I, I, mean, I don't even know the term data cleaning. Like, where do I start? Thank you. That's actually the best question. Where, where does someone start, Enrico? And I, I, and I know the answer is to like, take a course with you, but that, I, don't think that's what, I don't think that's what we were fishing for. I think... My, my gut reaction to your question is I wouldn't start from the question of what is a, the best tool, but it's more like what, what should I learn first? Because first I would, I would start with learning the, the, the main notions and principles, right? Because tools are always changing one way or another. Um, that said, um, if you want to start with, with data visualization in an easy way without, without programming, uh, there are many tools out there. Um, can I mention specific yeah, tools? Yeah, please. So um, Tableau, of course, is, is, is a great tool. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's, it's very easy. You can very quickly load a data set and through drag and drop create, create um, very useful data visualizations. What I really like of the way Tableau works is that it kind of like exposes what is called, I'm, I'm going to use a technical term, what is called the grammar of graphics, which is some sort of l visual language that you can use to build data visualizations. And in a way, as you learn to use Tableau, you are implicitly learning the grammar. I don't know if it makes sense. Um, another tool that I really like that is, is created, um, uh, is being created for uh, data journalism is called Data Wrapper. It comes from a, from, a, from a company that is based in Germany. And one of the founders is a former graphic editor of, of New York Times. And um, they are doing an excellent job is, uh, in uh, uh, providing really good um, data visualization defaults for a number of classic data visualization problems that journalists are confronted with. And, this is ties back to something I wanted to say before about, about the previous question about uh, Please. we have complex tools, uh, we have powerful tools, and now with these tools, we are, it's so much easier to create complex visualizations and, of course, quote unquote, abuse it. Uh, I agree, but I also think that people like uh, those who are behind Data Wrapper are doing a fantastic job at providing really good defaults and really good ways to think about data visualization. So a, a tool can be powerful, but also guide people in the right direction. And I think this is really important. There are, there are tools out there that don't have good defaults, whereas there are other tools that are really good defaults. And I think this makes a really big difference. When you say guide people um, in the right direction, I mean, who are the people? The people, the creators the of the graphic or the, or the viewer? The journalists. Because I think part of the earlier question was that People are doing graphics for people who can't understand what is being shown. I mean, these things can get very challenging. Yeah, I don't want to turn this into an advertisement for these tools, but uh, I, the two tools I mentioned, mm -hmm. I think typically, especially Data Wrapper, doesn't allow anyone to create something that is necessarily too crazy. Most of the, mm -hmm. most of the visualizations that you can create with it are at the same time powerful, but easy to, to read. And um, I hmm. could go on forever. But. Okay, but let's take another question. If you'd please, you've been patient. Hi there. Uh, my focus as a journalist is uh, climate change. And I'd be curious to hear examples of where you think climate change has been visualized well, and any ideas you have for how to better visualize climate change and its impacts. Hmm. Actually, there are a couple uh, of interesting issues there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question. Let's see. Uh, I think um, there are a number of um, graphics that a journalist call, uh, named Peter Aldis has done for BuzzFeed. He's a self-taught mapper. 
and he's done a series of maps, I think actually maybe Maybe I have them in here. I um, would be great. It's very hard to talk about pictures without yeah. showing them. You know, it's it's, um, it's tricky. I've loaded a um, somewhere else, but he he's done a, yeah. a series that um, let people explore uh, what's going to happen in their area. So you can look at um, how the you know the potential for flooding in your area has changed. You can look at um, when the last major fire near your house was, and I think that these kinds of visualizations are important now that we are having impacts to, to really show people that this is everybody's problem uh, and to you know, make it a, a, a less big abstract problem and more something that you can see in your, you know, you can see where you are on the map. Uh, so I think that's, that's one thing that I, I've seen recently that's, that's so nice. So in the marriage of, of climate related impact data to very local mapping, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Did you have an example that you wanted yeah, to show us? And while you're looking it up, you wanted to add your point, and I have a question I want to ask you about as a follow-up to her question. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Uh, regarding climate change, I think well, one of the most successful that I've seen around is the climate stripes. I think probably many of you saw them. Are, are people familiar with? with Did anyone no, see explain, the climate explain. stripes? I'm surprised. Explain. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah okay. the climate so, right. are okay, yeah, Some people have. <laughs> I saw somebody who had, is, to, had to put on their car. Yeah, I mean, some people have, so but this, some people have so explain it. The story behind the climate stripes is um, this climate, uh, climate climatologist from the UK, who is actually an academic, a professor. I don't remember exactly. I think from University of Reading. And he created just these climate stripes that are colorful using color that shows how okay. the average temperature around the world has changed over the years and uh -huh. it goes from very blue to very red yeah. Yeah. and it kind of like goes against all the rules of how to visualize data properly and but they work really well why do they work well because they they communicate very effectively what what the message behind it is and instantly and it's been instantly. And the message behind it the message behind it is Everything is getting warmer. It's change. Right? It's a progressive change. <laughs> right? okay. and, and you don't have uh -huh. to explain it. If uh -huh. I show you the climate stripe, yeah. it would be yeah. uh, obvious. So I want to ask a, a more, that's a great example, and, and then I want to look at this map, but just to follow up. So I write about climate every once in a while, I mean yeah. regularly, and I'm always bombarded with citizen scientists, self-appointed yeah. people who are well-meaning and they can go to these data sets and they instantly pick out a version of a temperature record that they like sure. that proves their point yeah. and whatever and then they hurl it at my head where it yeah. will leave a bruise yeah. and I wonder if, you know I don't think they're being argumentative because they're mean-spirited they're looking at the data and they see if they started here and started there it looks very different from what we are alleging as journalists is the trend. So my question to you is, if there's a time series, and temperature is a good example in climate change, to be transparent, to be uh, trustworthy, and this is for both of you, I mean, can I, can I as the journalist just like pick out the part of the graph I like? I mean, uh, or do I have to sort of every time I wanna talk about warming in the Western Hemisphere or whatever, include like a fever chart that has all 1800 years of tree ring data or whatever the, the question is. How far back do I have to go to be honest or not honest? How can I, in a time series? It's, it's hard to tell. I think this, this goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. Necessarily when you, when you want to communicate a message, you want to find the that part of the data that communicates that mm -hmm. message more effectively mm -hmm. and that's part that's a solution that is also mm -hmm. part of the problem um, in climate science as well as in in other complex systems the the problem again goes back to to the data um, right right um, there's so much to say about how the data is gathered how part of the data is gathered and some other parts of the data is gathered we could go on forever. The science behind it is so complex that at some point you can't express everything within the the confines of a of a of an article. Okay, and, but yeah. Betsy and Enrico, 
issues of trust and transparency with this kind of data and these kinds of visualization are at the heart of so many journalistic arguments that we have about these important topics. What should we be doing as visual journalists, and this is a question for both of you, to communicate um, the sources, we, what, what do we do to make us uh, trustworthy? Why should a reader, given that the data is an argument, as we established at the beginning, why should they believe it? Well, transparency is important to say where the data came from. And, uh, you know, I think your, your question about how far back to go in the record, I, you know, might depend on, on what your story is, but I think it's important to have as much context as possible with that. You know, otherwise you're talking about, you know, the polar vortex indicating that climate change is, you know, global warming is not happening. Well, but yeah, I mean, but, I get those. Yeah, but, uh, you know, journalists would never do that. <laughs> no, but, okay, no, no, but I don't I, I mean to beat I, this one into the ground, but it's a nice concrete example. So we, every year, those of us in the audience and online, whatever, who write about the warmest year yet kind of story, they're always in January and early February in the modern record, which goes back to 1840, you know? So that's what that story will be about. But I'll, we'll always have readers who'll go like, oh yeah, but if you look at it from 1998 to 2020. But why would you do that? What started because in 1998? they're just looking at the graphs and they see if you look at that, it's actually a plateau, or so they would argue. I mean, yeah. it's well, not. Well, if the world but, started in 1998, or industrialization started in 1998, or something started right, so in 1998. Right, so you're right in the argument important. right there. You've got like three different charts already, just yeah. right there. Um, but none of those things are true, so the, it's a completely, it's, you know, it's hard to think of what uh, the relevant but story they're not, is. But they're not, not true either. See, that's sort of the yeah. problem with yeah. data visualizations. Yeah. You can well, yeah, kind there, of there's the question, intellectually cut and paste. There's a question of what to include, and that's yeah. sort of what we're talking about here. Right. And then there's the question, you know, the, the, the fact that you can take the same data and visualize it in many different ways mm -hmm. and get very different stories out of the exact same mm -hmm. data. And so, um, you know, I think it's, that's a thing that's important for readers of maps and visualizations to understand. And I don't think people think about visualizations critically like that. How would we source it? What do you mean? Well, is that part of the, the transparency trust thing? So here's my chart, here's my map, and then will this, uh, how much should I reveal about how I built my tool to go through Yelp and as much and as possible as much as possible and okay. you know if you can make the tool available so other people can try it then links to where the data came from if you if you can if it's accessible the more the better and okay. that I think just in itself will really? help the trust issue so for any data visualization you need to source it as thoroughly and as openly as you would source an article yeah, if I can add something to that, I, I, I think every complex problem out there is necessarily nuanced. So personally, I, I don't know if that's true for everyone, but personally what I like in journalism is when I read something that is nuanced. It's not necessarily black mm -hmm. or white. Yeah. So for me, nuance is a form of, of trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand that there is a limitation there because um, you can't write a whole textbook. <laughs> you, have to, you have to read an article, yeah. but I think some, some journalism is better than some other journalism when it offers a, um, mm. um, not necessarily balanced, but nuanced argument. Uh, and when something is uncertain, explains when, why and when something is uncertain, or how much certainty we have in something or something else. And I think that's really important. That's a, that's a clear divide between uh, what I personally find interesting or uninteresting journalism. Hmm. Do we have a question? So I wanted to ask, how do you think data visualization contributes to or might enable poorly devised statistical analysis like p-value mining? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I think in general, visualization is really good at revealing problems with, with your data. 
or problems with any process that has been uh, recorded through data? So my answer is a little bit broader than what you asked. But I think in general, data visualization is really, really useful as a diagnostic tool. Um, I, have, I found- Really? How oh, so? Absolutely. How, how so? Both of you are nodding. Ex um, expand, please. Virtually every time I, in my work, I, I had to collaborate with someone who was the sur source of questions and data. Once we start visualizing it in, in a certain way, they're surprised uh, they're surprised that the data reveals something that is somewhat counterintuitive, right? So th there's one, one way to describe the power of data visualization that, that I've heard many years back is that through data visualization, you can find what, what is expected and what is unexpected. It's kind of like confirmation of some of the things that you believe, but also surprises. And I think when something is surprising is really interesting and visualization is really powerful as a tool to, to, to be surprised about something. We all have in our head an idea of when, when we collect data and we visualize it, the person who is looking at the visualization has an idea, a mental model of the world that has been captured through the data. Once it's visualized, now I can see it with my eyes and I can find discrepancies be, be, between what I believe is true and what is depicted in the data. Betsy? Yeah, I've had uh, a lot of conversations with um, scientists and data visualization experts about this. And there's, um, in particular, there's a, a, a group at the Broad Institute at MIT that mm -hmm. is there to help scientists, you know, explore their data through visualization and, you know, maybe present it to, but primarily on the exploration side. And time and time again, they'll come in and say, you know, I want to see this aspect of the data, and they'll look at different ways to visualize it and discover that, you know, either they were wrong or there's something far more interesting in there that they hadn't thought of before. And until they were able to see the data, uh, they couldn't they couldn't see that aspect of of their own mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be able to come up with an example no, that I okay. remember, but that that's yeah. definitely something that. That happens yeah. a lot. This, this happens mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hi. So I really liked what Enrico said about the grammar of graphics. Mm -hmm. I yes. come from the world of comics, and similar language is used to describe such pictorial oh, yeah. languages. Like the auth the line is the author's voice. So I'm wondering, do y'all have any grammar school recommendations or any tools that we can use to better understand images like data visualization? Um, Tools. I, I, I'm just not sure I understand completely your question. What do you mean by tools to understand data visualization? Sorry. Yeah, come back, come back, come back. <laughs> I'm sorry. I understood your the first part. I got lost on yeah. the second part. Right. So just better ways that we can look at an image and mine it for the data that it is presenting. The data visualization data, kind of. I, I, I guess as you're, a viewer, you're sort of arguing like- As a viewer like, or as a creator? As a viewer, as yeah. a viewer, so that we can better viewer. create data well, shouldn't Okay, so shouldn't the chart or shouldn't the graphic be telegraphing that information to the watcher here? I think, the, I think most people who make charts would, would say that that's probably true, okay. but I have talked to- um, But is it true? <laughs> Well, you know, we're capable of so much more with visualization now, and there's, you know, we have access to so much more data that there is maybe an argument to be made for better visualization literacy among the, the population. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's, you know, that's a, that's a question yeah. for, for someone else. Um, I don't know, there's, uh, for better, to better be able to read, I don't know, I think trying to make visualizations will make you a better reader of visualizations. Um, uh, and I was going to add to the tools that uh, mm -hmm. Enrico brought up. If, you're, if you want to make a map, um, there is at last uh, tools that are accessible to anybody. Any, any journalist could find a geographic data set and make a map. It might not be good, but um, there's Mapbox. And it's free online. There's a free tier to all of these. And Carto also. And they have different strengths. Um, and, and weaknesses, but you could, you could go on there, you could go to the open uh, data portal for, uh, for New York City, grab a data set, and you know, within a, an hour or two have made an actual map. 
And uh, a nice thing about those is that the default is not the rainbow color scale. Um, but like you said, defaults are important in visualization tools, and that's, you know, I think part of why a lot of those rainbows get into journals is because that for many, many years was the, the default, but that's, that's changing. So I want to get to our questions, but I would like to, to uh, find out what it was you liked so much about <laughs> well, I, the know, mapping were... uh, visualization of this uh, climate data. I mean, I think, you know, the, the headline will tell you, you'd probably be interesting in looking, uh, interested in looking at this, and it, you know, you can The headline out being, the... is your home at risk of flooding? Yeah. from rising seas yeah. by 2050. And then every, every spot that you look at on the map, you get um, uh, a percentage of you know, how many houses in that zone are gonna be in the flood zone and what the current total value of all those uh, structures is, which is interesting. Um, but I was just using these as examples of uh, you know, making the, the climate change local, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, this shows sort of the, the sprawl, the, the uh, amount of paved area in, I think, Houston. Mm -hmm. That looks like Houston. Uh, and he, he's made those for maps all over the country. Um, this is looking at whether the, f the fires were caused by humans or by n natural causes like lightning. Um, so you can see sort of what kind of fires are in your area. This is showing the, um, the areas of Earth that I think are already above the two degrees uh, Celsius warming that everybody's warning. And warning do you about. find the color scale there is good? Is there anything in particular technically about this uh, visualization that appeals to you? No, I mean, it's you? fine. It's a, you or know, is it's it just a, simply the act that they did this? Yeah, it was just an example before we were talking mm -hmm. about you know, um, okay. climate things. Uh, yeah, so that's... It's not a particularly attractive map, but I mm -hmm. think it's an effective map because um, you can you can see, you know, what areas are already have you know, on average, gone beyond the two degrees Celsius mm -hmm. warning. I think that's what this map mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Um, so just you know, things that things that make climate change more personal, mm -hmm. I think, are are sort of what we're getting at there. And I had um, the. Go ahead, ask, ask. No, no, Enrica, do you have any thoughts you want to add to the visualization of climate change with mapping? I think one thing that I, I'm always thinking about data visualization and climate change is that the very large majority of existing visualizations are visualizations about the past and data that we have collected that would be much more interesting to, to visualize future, mm. the future and mm -hmm. future scenarios. I think that would be much more interesting. Ah. That's a hideous rainbow map. What, and it's a well, map of? For example, this is a gravity map of the moon. And can you mm -hmm. tell? Uh, oh, I guess wrong. I thought that was Mars. There you can go. Can you tell by looking at it um, you know, quickly which is high gravity and which is low gravity? I mean, does, you know, there's no reason to understand if red is more than yellow or less. Okay. <laughs> so that's just. So wait a minute, no, 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 come on. Okay, so you're so smart. What would you do? How would you solve this problem? We use a single color ramp. And just use it as a yeah, so intensity? Use, use hues of one color, uh -huh. or maybe two okay. colors. If okay. you have uh, you know, some point in the data that's important, like zero degrees, or uh -huh. you know, places that have warmed versus cooling, or you know, above and below the average gravity, I suppose, would be something. Uh -huh. but so the gradient would there by be just naturally communicative as opposed to yeah, and also this, which needs a very complicated Yeah, and also, uh, you'd, you know, because like you can see all kinds of sharp edges in there that probably don't exist. Um, and if you use a single hue, then people will be better yeah. able to understand the underlying data if it's matched to the to the. And it says something, I suppose, that I can't tell the moon from Mars with that either. I assume yeah. that was Mars. I'm pretty sure it's <laughs> No, no, I think you're right. It's, uh, there's a very similar one. Could very well be Mars. Um, oh, these are the so, color gradients. Yeah, this is the this is a simultaneous contrast problem where those two squares with stars in them are the same color. And so you can see if you are looking at um, you know a typical uh, heat map that geneticists use all the time, 
that green square down there all by itself that looks pretty bright, if you moved it up there, it's probably one of the darker squares up there. So this might look hmm. like something that's worth paying attention to in the data, but when, you know, in reality, perhaps it's not. So there's an example of how that can be misleading. Cool, question. Thank you for your patience. So I like both simple and complex graphics, the ones that you can manipulate um, at Scientific American and probably Wired and National Geographic or Betsy's work. We would call them information graphics, the ones where you are kind of manipulating the information. You have to interact with the visual itself. And then I also like what my friend at Siam, Jen Christensen, who was so great with all kinds of graphics there, would call like an info poster, which mm. is, you know, like, yeah, a bar chart. Pie chart. Mm -hmm. Just kind of put them all together. So I started thinking about like the privileging of, and I don't mean this like in the big social justice way, of uh, I mean more in like the, you know, cultural studies way, of like visual literacy over text literacy. We're also mm -hmm. very focused here mm -hmm. in NYU journalism and in journalism in general. There's definitely a privileging or a focus on text literacy over visual hmm. literacy on text storytelling over at least still visual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. storytelling, even though we live in this incredibly you know, video and TV laden environment. Mm. It's interesting to me that we don't have better visual literacy skills. And I'm just wondering, should science communicators and journalists be moving more in the direction of visual literacy? Um, you know, Pictures are how we first learn and understand information. It's so interesting to me that we focus so much on the text storytelling. So should we be shifting our skills more toward visuals? And if so, how do we, where do we go next? I think that's a really interesting question. And I would ask you to stay at the microphone because once uh, Betsy and Enrico weigh in, you're a science educator. I want to hear what your answer is too. Just because you asked the question doesn't get you off the hook. <laughs> Enrico, how would you answer that? Are we privileging text uh, over visual literacy? And is that uh, dumb? <laughs> um, I, I, it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, yes. I think. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything intelligent to say. Um, yes, at, at the same time, I think data journalism and the use of visualization in journalism has been one of the major trends in the last 10 years, almost. Um, maybe the answer is that, yes, it takes time, but maybe I'm... I don't know. I'm not in journalism myself, so I may have a completely different lens from you. Um, from the outside, I think journalism is going a lot in that direction. Um, it takes time. I will actually see the same development that happened in journalism. I would like to see them happening in other fields where I think they, they need to catch up, in science, for instance. Yeah, I was going to say That's, that yeah. Yeah, yeah. Scientists, ahead, scientists typically do not get any training in data visualization, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it, or often in statistics. Sometimes if they do have statistics, that's the only data visualization instruction hmm. they get, and that's problematic. But I, you know, I think particularly for science journalists, um, you know, visual literacy, as, um, as you were asking about before, would definitely be a good idea um, you know, if we could understand the, uh, just like we, just like being able to understand how the statistics works better, being able to understand, um, you know, read a graphic and find problems or, you know, get what the scientist at minimum is getting out of the mm -hmm. graphics would definitely be a good idea. And um, I don't know, I mean, the tools are, are getting more and more accessible. So, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe there should be a data journalism, da data visualization class requirement. So, I would have liked that. Yeah, so, <laughs> so Robin, you teach as well as uh, being a, an accomplished journalist, science journalist. So how has your sense of 
the balance between text and visual literacy, journalism, whatever you'd like to call it. How has that changed over the arc of your career? Not a lot, really. Um, I think to answer what your question is asking, I would say not a lot. Of course, in my career, it has changed because I've been lucky to work at better quality, more sophisticated publications over time. So. With that comes more sophisticated graphics. But mm -hmm. if I think about sampling visual representations and visual storytelling over the decades of my career across publications, across mm -hmm. media, at least print and online media, I don't, I see more sophisticated storytelling, but the percentage of it is the same, more or less, you know, rounding. And I still see a lot of marginalization of visual storytelling, or at least graphic and information graphic storytelling. Um, it's like this little the graphics, get, get, the, yeah, graphics the graphics ghetto. team, this little <laughs> ghetto. We, we we admire them, we adore them, but there's one of them for ten of us. And um, it'd be interesting if we changed that ratio. Yeah. No, I I think it's an interesting question, and I know that my answer would be that yes, it's stupid to have that separation and it is not just a question of statistical uh, sophistication and knowing which uh, tool to use that actually it, it, it requires us as journalists to embrace a level of aesthetics and uh, imagination um, that I think makes us a little uncomfortable. Well, and also I, I think j journalists sometimes fail to um, apply the same critical thinking to visual, you know, to, to figures. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, and for example. Yeah, you is, want to show us something? Because then I want to show us something. One of our current president's no, favorite um, yeah, please. maps, right? That's the, um, that's the 2016 electoral map. And obviously the message that uh, the, the winner of this uh, mm -hmm. election wants to convey is that, you know, the most of the country is red. And, uh, you know, this is a map of geography, so it's, com you know, it's completely relevant. It's not a map of people. And if you look at things in a different way, like here's a, here's a way from the New York Times to, to uh, you know, to visualize that problem. Um, you know, we know she got... Oh, yeah, I thought this was very clever. You know, I don't, I don't know, three, six however many million more votes, but it looks like, you know, there's just very little of the country. And especially online, these electoral maps, this is by precinct, are highly saturated. And I think there's also issues with how we see red versus blue that make this even worse. And if you just change it a little bit, you start to get a different story. Um, this is a map, I think, that's um, putting the colors only where the population is. So that looks different. Here's another way of looking at the same story where, you know, the, 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 the size of the, uh, of the bubble of, of the circle is proportional to yeah. the amount that the county is leaning in that direction. You could also do that, you know, with uh, population to get a more Yeah. Do you think that starts to get into the zone that uh, Dan Fagan was just talking about where it's too complicated to understand without like... I don't uh, think that's, I mean... I don't think that's the, actually that complicated, and it's more okay. accurate in some ways, mm -hmm. depending on what you're looking at. Um, just the point is, journalists, you know, should be aware that um, that maps like this are not what's called normalized for the relevant uh, value, which is population. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it. I mean, this one, this one actually is in some ways, but uh, in general, the. I don't think I have a state one, do I? No. no uh, um, you know, it's 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 not a very good way of conveying that data. Yeah, and it, and it's and, and it's, it's misleading. Well, and it it does more than just affect how you look at the data. This is how we now think. Yeah. About well, and you put our version of political yeah. polarization right now, and it sort of feeds back on itself. Yeah. Uh, and if you Dan, put something on a you're, map, you're, yeah. you're looking it. at that like a moth at the candle. <laughs> So. I thought for sure, Betsy, that you were going to follow that with 
one of those uh, maps where we actually distort the continent. Oh, uh, yeah. But in, there we go. Yeah. yeah. There so we go. That's, yeah. that's called a cartogram where you're actually, you know, distorting yeah. the geography to match Ask the population. Ask and you shall be answered, Dan. There you go. <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's a comparison one of, um, this m m might be a different election. Can but you unpack the idea of the cartogram here? Let, we can tell it's being so distorted, the, the, but what's the idea? The size the, of the, of the um, state on here yeah. is proportional to how many people are, are in that state. So, um, you know, so, or how many, how many votes in, in that area. So you get a more accurate uh, comparison of the two colors. Mm. Uh, and there's, you know, there's tons of other ways so to do it. So if you lived on one of the coasts, that's what you, how you'd like the electoral college to work, right? Is that the idea? <laughs> So. Yeah, I'm. You know, I. It. It's just it, that looks very different, right? Sure. Um, when you vary, you know, because geography is is not a a, a great uh, way to show election data because of the the vast differences in in how many people live in different places. It's just like if you show a map of, you know, where people are tweeting about coronavirus, I'm sure this map must be out here, right? Um, mm -hmm. if you if you're not yeah. thinking about it, you're just basically going to be putting a map of population centers. So, you know, that's that sort of thing happens a lot and I think, you know, people and particularly journalists need to think m more about, you know, what these visualizations are actually showing. Enrica, you were thinking about something? With the... No. No? Okay. No. So a question. <laughs> no, no, I just don't want to, I didn't want to uh, uh, step on your, on your thought if you had one. I'm sorry. Please. Um, so you both talked about the importance of the selection of data, of picking the right data to show before you even get to work on the design and portrayal of it. But I'm wondering, uh, as a journalist at least, once you've made that decision of, okay, this is data that I want to represent in a story. Um, what then are, we, we, you talked about a few of them, but what then mm -hmm. are some other potential pitfalls that journalists commonly fall into when they're trying to show that data accurately? Yeah, like, you mean like labeling or icons? Yeah, or, beyond the, yeah. Like or, the, or what yeah, kind of the chart? Yeah, the rainbow yeah. map. Or what kind of chart? Yeah, example, okay. But, but yeah, I'm just wondering for a couple more yeah. examples of can you Can you address mistakes. that? That's a good, so. So, I don't know. I think in general, I don't know specifically only about journalists, but yeah, selecting or using the, the wrong chart is a common problem, or showing too much at once is a common problem. Um, I think in general, it's hard to, to distinguish completely between what you are visualizing and how you visualize it. I think we have a tendency to think about visualization as only the act of creating a visual representation of something, whereas I think you can't really um, remove the part where you decide what information to extract from a given data set. Uh, the two things go hand in hand. Unpack that a little bit. That's interesting. Um, I'm wondering if I can give an example. Um, not too specific, but mm. so w whenever we want to create a visualization, we start from some data set. Mm -hmm. And a data set has some information. Before this information is visualized, can be manipulated or transformed in many different ways. And actually, if you want to create a specific kind of visualization, we have to transform the data mm -hmm. in some way. So because of that, there's really not, not a sharp distinction between what you do in the realm of data and data transformation and what you do in the realm of giving a visual representation to this data. The two things go together. So some of the design decisions that you have to make when you visualize data pertain to deciding how to transform the data to generate a certain type of chart. So the two things go together. I, I think it's just, you know, the m most important thing is to figure out exactly what you're trying to say <coughs> with the graphic and then determine if, you know, the, the way you've chosen to do it is actually conveying that. 
if if you know the the if the aspect of the data is what's being showcased, I guess, by and, and, and what's easiest to get out of the graphic. I have to say that yeah. one of the most common problems that I see around is um, when I look at a chart or a visualization, what am I supposed to extract out mm -hmm. of this graph? Right? Sometimes there's so much going on Mm -hmm. that it's really hard to figure out how am I supposed to read this. I think that's one of the most important mm -hmm. tests. Can I add a layer to that? Um, yeah. In our conversation earlier, you mentioned something I found really very compelling, which was this idea of statistical numbing, um, <laughs> that a large, complicated graphic of particularly um, heart-rending, tragic, uh, very human, yeah. large phenomena. I mean, uh, mass murders and <clears throat> fill in the blank, I don't know. That somehow so many numbers which are meant to convince us and persuade us and move us have the opposite effect. They turn everything into kind of hard, informational, little stale yeah. candies. I mean, what do we do, what can we do to combat that? You've worked with something that I heard you call anthropographics. Yes. So I think that's one of the most, quote unquote, terrifying results that I discovered in, in, in psychology research that is related to data visualization. There's, there's a renowned uh, psychologist, his name is, is Paul Slovic. Hmm. And um, he's been studying the problem of how do, we co how do we communicate information about tragedies and how do, we, um, how do we communicate information so that people are compelled to act. Mm -hmm. And one of the most egregious examples that he uses is the tragedy in Rwanda. Back then we had all the information that we needed, mm -hmm. but we were not able to convey the information in a way that people wanted to act. Uh, especially, especially uh, sorry, especially uh, decision makers. Mm. Um, and so he, he did a lot of research on sh showing that basically shows that um, the same way there are limitations of the way of visual perception, there are also limitations, cognitive limitations that our mind and brains have. And one of these limitations is that it's very hard for us to reason over large numbers. Because of that, if I'm talking, say, to you about the tragedy of one person, you're going to have a very strong reaction because you can think about this person. You have a lot of empathy mm -hmm. for one person. But if I start talking about 50 persons, mm -hmm. it's different. If I talk about a million persons, you can't wrap your head around a million. A million or two million. The difference between one million and two million to us is nothing, but it's huge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So, and Paul Slavik ran a number of experiments showing that that's that's what that's the kind of reaction that people have. If I show you the story of one person, the reaction is much much stronger than showing statistics about a hundred persons, or a thousand persons, or a million persons, and 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 that's. Uh, Discouraging. Yeah, I was just going to say, so the, <laughs> me really the message of this is yes. that we shouldn't do graphics that uh, depict large uh, human So effects. you asked the question, no, yeah, yeah, asking yeah. me what is the solution. I don't have a solution. So we, some of the little research that we, we've been uh -huh. trying to do in, our, in my lab has been trying to see if visualization can play a role can it? in the sense that no. <laughs> apparently, well, apparently, I don't know. I don't know. It's well in science, everything is preliminary. So sure, I would sure, love sure, to sure. have someone yeah. that comes back and says, "Look, what you did is wrong," and it no, does I mean, have I've, an impact. I've, I've heard people <laughs> right. actually say, "Well, one thing you should do is like instead of having little dots, like have the icons be little people." I mean, that's what we'll, we thought. Then we'll identify yeah. with the with the little people who are the subject of genocide in Rwanda or, I mean, to pick a, I don't mean to be, make light of that, I'm just trying to think yeah, of a large Yeah, yeah. so I think what, what we try to do in, uh, in our research is to say, oh, it's possible that the way you visualize something 
is actually part of the problem. If I show you some numbers or a pie chart or a bar chart, people just don't feel a lot of empathy for a bar chart, yeah. right? So maybe if I kind of like humanize this a little, a little, a little more, a little better, uh, then people start relating a little bit more to 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 the actual people who are behind numbers. And we developed this idea of what we call anthropographics, where there are data visualizations that try to convey more closely or more effectively the idea that there are people behind the data. Um, we failed to do that. <laughs> we tried a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I think now we don't have time to, to so discuss that it in a detail. That remains but a we challenge. tried a lot of different mm -hmm. things, like little mm -hmm. icons or using less aggregation and more units to see that behind mm -hmm. the statistics there are a hundred people, a million people, a hundred thousand people. Um, it doesn't seem to work very well. Betsy, you <laughs> threw this up on the wall for us. What do you, what do no, you? No, that's just, I meant to show it earlier. It's just an, ex <laughs> you know, an example of, uh, of you know, two different ways you can show the same data that, that you know, may be effective for different points. But uh, as, as far as what, uh, what you guys were talking about, um, that surprises me because, you know, I'm sure you remember the racial dot map. Mm -hmm. this, you know, this map, people went insane for this map, that showed, um, you know, color-coded for race, one dot for each person in different cities. And for some reason, the individual dots seemed to make a much bigger impression on people than other maps of the same data had before and I thought that it was because you know the dots were people but Th that's no. my intuition <laughs> as well and again it's mm -hmm. possible that we yeah. fail to yeah. find an effect that yeah. does exist right. in our experiments it doesn't show yeah. up the dehumanizing <laughs> effect of but I, I have exactly the same intuition can be profound yeah. but that, that they have breakthrough moments which I suppose offer. Uh, I mean, I don't know why people like that map. Yeah, but well, that's the question. <laughs> I thought it was because the dots. Yeah. We have time, I think, for one last okay. question. So uh, I have a question about projections because I'm studying civil engineering at NYU. So a lot of times we talk about things like how many people are going to be moving into urban areas. We need to plan for that. So I guess my question is, how do you show uncertainty visually? Oh, well, what? Thank you very much for asking that question. <laughs> thank that's, you. Uh, that's a I huge want to hear one. both of you address this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm projecting the yeah, future, it's a but I got to tell you, I'm not so sure. How do I do that visually? It's a, there's a whole area of research right now that is blossoming around mm -hmm. visualization, how to visualize uncertainty. Um, there are some classic techniques to do that, and uh, researchers are developing new ones. Um, I would say there's nothing too established. Um, you just make the line dotted? Yeah, you make that, yeah. I think an interesting one that- I'm trying to um, visualize that. <laughs> Go, please. There, there's a researcher at Northeastern University. I always confuse, no, Northwestern, sorry. <laughs> I always confuse the two. You wanna kill me now. Um, um, Jessica Hallman, she's, she's a good friend of mine and she's been, um, She's been experimenting with what she calls hypothetical outcome plots. Um, hmm. It would be nice to show them. I don't have them here. But the idea is to use um, animation to show how, frequent, how frequently something happens. And we seem to be really um, tuned to this, to, to understanding how frequent and how, how uncertain something is when it's animated. Hmm. Uh, now it's hard to describe something with words, something that is very visual. But uh, one of the new developments that I've seen in recent years in this in this area is this idea of using animation to show how frequent how frequently something happens, and we seem to be especially tuned to extracting uncertainty inf information or frequency information from from animation. Um, that said, there are standard techniques like box plots or level of transparency or even making say if you have lines making lines more or less crisp or objects more or less crisp to communicate the idea that something is more or less uncertain but um, yeah it's an open area of research and uh, there is a lot a lot of work to do there 
Jesse, as a practical matter, how would you handle I that problem? I thought his question was about map projections, so yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought the same Which I was all excited to answer. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, I, thought, I, I thought so be. too. I thought so too. So um, that's the transparency question. I mean, you, really. you know, th this is a question we deal with in text all the time too, with science journalism, is you know, how, how to convey how much uncertainty there is with a certain finding or what we're describing. It's a really difficult question. Yeah. I don't know the answer. And it's, you know, it, it points out this fact that visualizations, and I think in particular maps, are very powerful. If you, if you put something on a map, people will believe it's true because there's an element of it that's true. You know, the, well, you know, not exactly because of the projections, but the geography is somewhat true. And so it, it just lends it this uh, sort of weight that um, I think is can be dangerous and very effective for conveying both true things and fake news. Yeah, it just just reminded me that an, another another powerful method that has been researched recently is the idea of showing multiple possible outcomes. Yeah. Right. So a very popular one is the idea of hurricanes. What kind of trajectory sure. an hurricane has. Yeah. In and then the if you don't like the trajectory, you can take a magic marker and just sort of, uh, <laughs> yeah, extend the, the range of the graph. Yeah. yeah. But, but That's very interactive. <laughs> it's a very interactive graphic. Yeah. But <laughs> the, that would be ridiculous. The idea that has, Sorry, been, please, the idea that has been explored is that if there are multiple future projections, then show multiple lines so that you can see these mm. are the possible project. Rather than yeah. showing the cone of uncertainty around one single path is to say, look, it could be this way or that way or that way or that way. And that's, that's another really yeah. powerful method that I've seen used yeah. recently. Now, if I were going to make a visualization of this evening's conversation, <laughs> I would, I think, do it as a kind of heat map where it would be sort of very kind of uh, bluish in the beginning where we sort of thought about this very complicated idea and we all then gradually warmed to the topic and things got very intense and by the end of the evening this was like pretty red stuff, pretty intense, pretty interesting, <laughs> pretty hot. It's a hot topic. You two made it hot. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks so much.